Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm 60 Days of Summer welcome to Mr. Dan Issel. Thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you all very much. All right, Dan, so here's what I'm wondering before we get into the thick stuff here. You and I have spoken a few times, and I've never actually asked this question. The Kentucky Colonels as a franchise really are a couple of decisions away from being an NBA team. Yeah. Have you ever thought about that in those terms? Absolutely. Um, for those of you that don't know, the ABA was a league that existed from 1966 uh, to 19, excuse me, 1968 to 1976. And what made that league so successful was at the time, the NBA would not take a player until his college class had graduated. Now, it didn't matter if you went to college, but you, you had to wait four years to be able to join the NBA. Well, the ABA didn't have that rule, and so we started taking players out of college early. And of course, one of the most famous ones is Dr. J right here, who went to the University of Massachusetts, to UMass, and came into the ABA uh, after his sophomore year. George McGinnis, who will be inducted, an uh, uh, Indiana Pacer player and Philadelphia 76er player, will be inducted uh, later this year in September, was another great player who came out of the University of Indiana early after his sophomore year. And so the ABA was able to exist because we were getting these great young players early. I mean, you can, there's a litany of them, George Gervin, that are in the Hall of Fame that came to the ABA early. George Gervin was another one. But then in 1976, there was a merger and the Kentucky Colonels uh, were not part of that merger. Uh, the four uh, ABA teams that went into the NBA are the Denver Nuggets, the San Antonio Spurs, uh, the Indiana Pacers, and what is now the Brooklyn Nets. They were the uh, New York Nets at the time. Those were the four teams that went in. But my Kentucky Colonel team was a great team. There are four Hall of Famers that are in this ring up here. I see one of them right there. Big A, Artis Gilmore, yep. Louis Dampier, and, and coach uh, Hubie Brown was the coach of that team. So that, that team, the Kentucky Colonels, had four Hall of Famers That's on that remarkable. team. remarkable, and still to this day, and we'll talk about that roster in a moment, because still to this day, I don't think that is a team outside of sort of hoop head walls that gets enough En enough attention from the modern from, from the modern hoop fans, but I want to dial it back to the 50s and 60s. Your upbringing, you're a Midwest guy, growing up in the 50s and 60s, playing basketball, and I can think of no bigger fantasy than hearing a knock at the door and having Adolph Rupp come through, sit in your living room, and ask you if you'd be willing to play for the University of Kentucky Wildcats. Can you recall? your recruitment and what those moments were like? Um, it, it was, uh, it, it's a funny, funny story. And it's, it's amazing how life turns because of a certain act. But another Hall of Famer, and I, I picked out his picture right up there, Adolph Rupp on the, uh, the top row, uh, was the coach that I played for at the University of Kentucky. So when you, when you think of, of all of the hundreds of thousands of people that have coached basketball and have played basketball, you're looking at the only people up here on this ring that have been inducted into the Hall of Fame. It's a very, very select group. And I was blessed in my basketball career to come in contact with a lot of these, a lot of these people up here. And playing for Coach Rupp at the University of Kentucky, but I went to the University of Kentucky kind of as a compromise. Uh, my, uh, I wanted to go to the University of Wisconsin, uh, which had been recruiting me, and my folks wanted me to go to 
Northwestern because it's a great a academic school and was only about a 45 minute drive from my hometown. And, um, and as a compromise, I wound up going to the University of Kentucky because that seemed to make everybody happy. And I, I can still remember to this day, I was, a, I was a senior in high school trying to make this decision and my father walked into my bedroom and we'd had hundreds of discussions about where I was going to go and, and, and he said, you know, he said, if you're serious about this basketball thing, he said, the University of Kentucky has had, at that time, it still may be true, the University of Kentucky has had more All-Americans, the University of Kentucky has put more players into professional basketball than, than any school. And uh, so if you're serious about this basketball thing, I, I think Kentucky would be a good choice. And it was the best advice I, I, best advice I ever received. Spoiler alert, you were serious about this basketball thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and 2,138 collegiate points later, it's a remarkable number. Three, when you were only allowed to play three years on varsity, yep. your 2,138 points still rank as the most ever by a Kentucky Wildcat, but it's one night in particular I'm curious about. 1970, you drop 53 points on Mississippi. Now, I know that you have played more games in your life than many of us, especially because you never missed games. But my question is, on that night, those 53 points, does that ring as a special night for you, or was that just another night at the office? It, it, it was very special because uh, those 53 points at that time was a school record for an individual game. Uh, Cliff Hagen, another yes. Hall of Famer up here from the University of Kentucky, had scored 51 points, and that was the record. And I scored 53 to break his individual record. That record has since been broken by Jody Meeks, who uh, scored 54 at Tennessee a few years ago. Uh, but I also set the career scoring record uh, at the University of Kentucky. And I can't believe, I graduated in 1970. So what is that, Kyle, 47 years ago? Yeah. And that, and that is still the record for the most points uh, scored in a career at Kentucky. Uh, and now, with the rules being what they are, I mean, anybody who can uh, dribble and, and chew gum at the same time leaves after his freshman year. And so that, that record might, might last for a while. But I'll tell you, Kyle, the thing that makes that game so, so pleasing for me was my father uh, picked out a couple of road trips. In those days, you would do back to back. They still kind of do, but a Saturday and a Monday. So we would go on the road and we'd play, uh, for instance, we'd play Georgia on a Saturday and Florida on a Monday night, uh, Alabama on a Saturday, Auburn on a Monday night. So we would make trips and, and, and get two games in one trip. And my father had la mapped out a schedule to go on a couple of road trips with the team every year uh, so that he, by the time my career was over, he would have visited every SEC school. And my senior year, he was a smart man, so he left Oxford, Mississippi, and Starkville till last. <laughs> and so <laughs> my senior year, he was, he was at that game, Kyle, that I scored the 53 points, and that's what makes it so special. That's remarkable, Dan. It yeah. really is. Your yeah. dad was a wise planner, and yeah. <laughs> or maybe you just saved, saved the best performances yeah. until your dad was there. <laughs> So now, 1970 is also a really special year for you because that was the year of your graduation. And after that, we already spoke about your joining the Kentucky Colonels, but there was a decision for you to make, another decision, right? You were drafted by the Detroit Pistons and the Kentucky Colonels right. in the same year. Now, obviously, as we spoke about, the ABA had the market cornered on young, exciting, high-powered, up-tempo games and talent. But the NBA, while it wasn't the powerhouse that it is now, it had the branding, it had the marketing, it had right. the staying power. Right. Can you talk to me about that decision to choose the ABA over the NBA? Yeah, 
About that time, the, the ABA was getting competitive with the NBA as far as signing players. And in fact, if you go back to 1970 and you look at what would be the consensus All-America team, uh, there were six players. There was Bob Lanier, uh, Pete Maravich, I saw Pete's picture around the corner here, uh, uh, Charlie Scott, Rick Mount, Calvin Murphy at Niagara, and myself. Those were kind of the consensus All-Americans. Three of those players, Bob, um, Pete, and um, who am I leaving out? And Calvin went to the NBA. Myself, Charlie Scott, and Rick Mount signed with the ABA. So. Um, it, for me, it was an easy choice. Louis Dampier, another Hall of Famer, uh, was a good friend of mine at Kentucky, and he was playing for the Colonels. Uh, I had married a, a gal from Lexington uh, a, a, who was a cheerleader at UK. That's how we met. And um, still married today, 48 years later. And so just to go down the road, the, the salaries were comparable. So just to go down the road and, and play with a friend, stay in Kentucky and play for the Colonels was a pretty easy decision for me. And, and basketball is glad that you did because we've spoken a little bit about that 74-75 run with you, Louis Dampier, Artis Gilmore, Hubie at coach. And we talk about that and I've spoken to all four of you now about that run. Was there a particular moment in that season where you all realized that, that something special was afoot? Yeah, it started on our championship ring. Uh, we have the number 21 and three. And through the last 10 games of the regular season uh, to get a home court advantage in the championships, uh, we won all 10 games. And then in the uh, in the, um, no, excuse me, 11 games. And then in the championship, in the series, we were 12 and three. We won each, each series four games to one. So we, we wound up 23 and three. And that's on our championship ring. That's how we finished the year that year. But that was, uh, that was a great team. I mean, obviously a team that would have three Hall of Famers on it is, is a pretty talented team. But uh, we had been close a couple of times before. Artis's rookie year, my second year, we set an ABA record. Our record was 68 and 16 during the regular season. And we were huge favorites to win the championship and got beat by the Nets. And so uh, by that time, Kyle, we were, we were pretty, well focused yeah. on winning a championship. It's incredible what, what failing to get there can do for the motivation to get through the tape. Have no question, no <laughs> it really question. Is. And, and, the, and the opposite, Kyle, if, if you are successful, as you, you look at my Chicago Cubs this year, <laughs> when, once you are successful, it's very hard to put in the work to repeat that success as, as well. Which is interesting because uh, after that championship in, se in, in that 74, 75 season, there's a now famous sort of challenge thrown down from your owners to the owners of the NBA. I'm not sure if those of you who are, maybe aren't of a certain age won't remember this. The challenge from the Kentucky Colonels to the Golden State Warriors to have a a playoff to see who indeed was the true champions of American basketball. Yeah. And you guys would very likely have won that. It, it, the, the, the NBA champs that, were, uh, that year, as Kyle just said, the Golden State Warriors had Rick Barry, um, Jamal, Jamal Wilkes, I mm -hmm. think, was on that team. Uh, and uh, they won the NBA championship. And there's no question in my mind we were a much better team than, than that Golden State Warrior team. And our, our owner did issue a challenge, but of course, uh, you know, the NBA was never going to let that happen. They weren't <laughs> were going to let a bunch of upstarts from the ABA come in and beat the NBA champions. 
<laughs> now, here's the part that I love, because here's what I'm going to prep you. After this next question, I'm going to ask which of you would like to ask a question of Hall of Famer Dan Issel. So after this next question, I'll ask you if you have a question to raise your hand. You'll be recognized, a few of you, by one of the great Hoop Hall staffers who will put you in line right here to my right, your left, and you too can have a chance to meet and ask a question of Dan Issel. So before the next season, you were traded away from Kentucky to the Baltimore Claws and then ultimately to the Denver Nuggets um, after the Baltimore Cl Claws folded up. Uh, do you remember how, what your reaction was to finding out about those transactions and what, what that felt like to a young Dan Issel to maybe be... I, I, I still get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. After four years at the University of Kentucky and five years with the Kentucky Colonels, I didn't think they could have a basketball team in Kentucky without me being a part of it. And I found out very quickly that uh, they could because, as Kyle said, I was uh, a strange series of events. Uh, I wound up in Denver. Uh, but again, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. In retrospect, we sure didn't think it was at the time. My wife and I had just built our dream home in Louisville. It, it took us 13 months to build it, and we lived in it 11 months oh. before we got traded. But um, it, it, worked out, it worked out great, because a year later, there was no Kentucky Colonels, there was no ABA, and I got to play for uh, some outstanding coaches, Larry Brown, another Hall of Famer, and Doug Moe uh, in, in Denver, and was able to play 10 more seasons with the Nuggets. How long did it take for Denver to feel like home? Because you're still there. Yeah, it, it took a while, because we had such ties to Kentucky. Uh, I remember one year, we, we, uh, we got beat uh, in the playoffs, and I was so upset and so wired We'd, we'd had the car packed, and we were going to drive back to Kentucky the next morning, uh, and we got beat, and uh, we got in the car that night and just started driving across <laughs> Kansas, and I drove until I couldn't stay awake anymore. So when we first went to Denver, we would go back to Kentucky as soon as the season was over and not come back to Denver till the season was about to start, but as our kids, I have a daughter uh, Sheridan and a, and a son Scott, as they got older and got more involved, we started, those, those trips to Kentucky became more infrequent and for a shorter duration. And so um, it was probably three or four years, but like you said, we've been in Denver ever since. So it's, uh, it turned out great. Now here's your chance. If you have a question for Dan Issel, can I, Kyle, before you yeah, do that, can I sure. do one thing? Yes, when, please. Whenever I talk to a young group of player, uh, players, girls and boys, I always bring up this story. And those of you over there can't see it, but this gentleman right here, for those of you that can, number 23, LSU, Pete Maravich. Pete Maravich was the greatest ball handler and passer I have ever seen. What he could do with a basketball was incredible. And Pete, as you, as you may or may not know, Pete is the all-time leading scorer in the history of co college basketball. He did it in three years, and he did it with no three-point line. And I tell people my senior year at Kentucky, I was the second leading scorer in the nation. And I only lost the scoring championship by 10 points a game. Pete averaged 44 points a game his senior year at LSU. But here's the part I want you to, I want, I want to <clears throat> make a, a, an impact on you all. Coach Rupp, his philosophy, a lot of coaches in the SEC would try to devise defenses to stop Pete. They do triangles and a double team, or they do a box and a chaser, trying to keep Pete from scoring. But Pete was so clever with the basketball, he could get an open shot no matter how many people were guarding him. So Coach Rupp, his philosophy was, we're going to play Pete one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to let Pete score because he's going to score anyway. And we're just not going to let anybody else beat us. 
Pete and I were contemporaries, same year. We played each other six times in our career. In those six games, Pete averaged 53 points a game. 53 <laughs> points a game. He had 63 our senior year at LSU. In those six games, averaging 53 points a game, the closest LSU ever came to beating Kentucky was nine points. So remember that, it's a team game. It's a team game, not an individual game. Thank you, that is a remarkable, that's a great point. Isn't that an unbelievable statistic? It's an unbelievable statistic. If you have a question for Dan Issel, raise your hand, you will be recognized by one of our great Hoop Hall staffers. Gosh, 10 points a game. <laughs> <laughs> now, on behalf of our friends at Hager Clothing, who have graciously provided all of our Hall of Famers with their new Naismith Orange Hall of Fame jackets, they are great? sharp, aren't they? Isn't that great? I'd love to ask the Hager Innovators question of the day. After your playing career was over, Bernie Bickerstaff tapped you, tapped you to, to, to coach the Denver Nuggets without any previous coaching experience. Done. A true trailblazing moment for you. In fact, a couple of years later, your Nuggets team pulled off one of the great upsets in uh, NBA playoff history, still to this day. Yep. Can you talk about that transition from on court to behind the bench and the way that that, that that trail seemed to be so seamless for you, so effortless? Well, it, it really is amazing. The Denver Nuggets, uh, this would have been in the early 90s, late 80s, the Denver Nuggets had the worst record in the NBA two years in a row. We were 20 and 62 and 24 and 58. And during those two years, I was doing the color commentary on the TV games. And uh, it was toward the end of that second year, our final game of the year was in Sacramento and I'm in my hotel room in Sacramento and um, I get a call from Bernie Bickerstaff, the general manager, and he said, have you ever thought about coaching? Now, I had never coached at any level, not junior high, not high school, nothing. <laughs> and so I said, coach who? And he said, coach the Denver Nuggets. And so we talked about it, and uh, he hired me, and uh, we had a great group of, uh, of players on that team. Another Hall of Famer, Dikembe Mutombo, was our center. Uh, Lafonso Ellis, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, Chris Jackson from LSU, and, uh, it, it, and the second year we were there, we made the playoffs by the skin of our teeth, and uh, we beat uh, we beat Seattle. And some of you may have may have seen what is now a very very famous pose of Dikembe laying on the floor, holding the basketball over his head when we. Uh, when, when we beat Seattle in that fifth game. One, one thing that a lot of people don't remember is that um, one of the key plays in that game was right at the end of regulation. Uh, uh, Sean Kemp went up for a two-handed dunk that would have given Seattle the lead in that game. And Dikembe caught the ball and took the ball and Sean Kemp to the floor in a, in a clean block. And so that was the end of regulation, and then we went to uh, overtime. And that overtime period, Kyle, was probably the worst example of basketball in the history of NBA <laughs> playoffs. I think there were like four 24-second shot clock <laughs> violations. Nobody could make a basket. Uh, Seattle had the best record in the NBA that year and they were scared to death they were gonna lose. And we had a young team that was just up and coming and we were scared to death that we might win. And, uh, and that overtime period was awful, but we, we beat them. And, and what a lot of people don't remember about that, Kyle, is the next series we played Utah with Stockton and Malone, two more Hall of Famers, and they had us down three games to none and we won the next three games. And to this day, no team in the history of NBA playoffs have come back from being down 0-3. And uh, we won three games in a row, but lost the seventh game in Utah. But that was, that was a great team and a lot of fun. I remember that postseason so vividly. I really do. 
Finally, Dan, can you reflect on what it means to be, we're, th we're 30 days ahead of 2017 enshrinement. You've been a member of the Hall of Fame for decades now. Can you reflect on what it means to be sitting here today, speaking underneath your own face and the face of so faces of so many that you have played with and played for and in front of these live fans of all generations? You know, um, where's Fran? Is Fran here? That, that's Mrs. Hall of Fame right over there, Fran, <laughs> Franny. And a couple of years ago, my grandson was in a baseball tournament at Cooperstown, and they had, my family, they had never been here. My daughter had, but not the grandkids. And Fran gave us a, a tour of the Hall of Fame. And her numbers, if I, if I can remember this right, Fran said in the history of the game of basketball, around the world, and this is an international, if you go up and look, I mean, there are plenty of international players up here and coaches. This is an international game. This isn't a United States game anymore. And Fran told my grandkids, she said, you know, we've been able to pred uh, predict that in the history of the game of basketball around the world, about 200 million people have been involved with our great game. There are less than 400 at that time. I, there, it might be 400 a little over now. There are less than 400 people in the Basketball Hall of Fame. And that is when it hit me how truly blessed all of us in this circle are. Let that sink in. Yeah, those numbers don't lie. <laughs> well, now we get to the hard questions, Dan. Okay. Because we got some, I mean, look at that. At least clearly, we've got some hard questions. Let's get some questions from the fans. Thank you for volunteering. I only have two requests. One is that you let me hold the mic, and two is that you introduce yourself to Mr. Issel before you ask your question. My name is Clinton Springer. I'm from Trumbull, Connecticut. And my question is, do you think Doug Moe is the greatest offensive-minded coach of all time? That's a very good question. That's excellent. Wow, I would have to, uh, I, I don't know if I could say he was the best of all time, but uh, he's certainly in the top three or four for sure. That's, that's a great question, a great question. Thank you very much. I told you, they throw fastballs. <laughs> These guys throw fastballs. <laughs> hey, bud. Yeah, it's interesting. When you get those all-time questions, those are always the most fun to reflect yeah. on because I'll be thinking about that for days now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, hello. Hello. My name is Kenyon, and I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. My name, my, my question is, what does it feel like to win your first playoff series? Um, you know, that's really, it, it's a great feeling because that's what you play for that you play the whole regular season to position yourself for the playoff series, to have home court advantage. And, and as I said before, basketball is a team sport. So winning the game is the number one priority. And so when you get to the playoffs and you win that first series and you advance to the next round, you still have this feeling, although it only happened to me once, I was only involved with one championship with the Kentucky Colonels, but you have a feeling that you can still get there and win another one. So it's a very special feeling. Great question, bud. Thank you. All right, let's keep it rolling. How are you, sir? Hi, Dan. Hi. Uh, Elliot Sachs, Somerset, New Jersey. I was uh, wondering, in college, and in pros as a center, who are the two or three toughest matchups you've had individually? Uh, you know, um, of course, Kareem comes to mind. Uh, Kareem, uh, in my estimation, I, of course, I didn't play against Bill Russell or, or Wilt Chamberlain. They were before my time. But in my estimation, Kareem's the greatest center that has ever played this game. And so that was always a tough matchup. But the one advantage I had as a center, I was, the, for most of my career, I was the second smallest center in the NBA. Um, Wes Unsel with Baltimore, 
or Washington bullets, was uh, the, the shortest center. And I was the second. But I, I had the ability to go out on the floor, could shoot a 15, 18 foot mid-range jumper, could put the ball on the floor. So the big, what's a good word to say? Uh, lethargic centers I, I could take advantage of. The one player that, could, that was quicker, bigger than me, and quicker than me and could come out and guard me on the floor and not let me get to the basket or not let me get an open jump shot was another Hall of Famer, Moses Malone. And so I've always said Moses was the toughest, toughest center I had to play against. How about at, at Kentucky? At Kentucky, um, there was a big guy from Tennessee that played with the Chicago Bulls, a guy by the name of Tom Borwinkle. And Borwinkle was a huge man. And once he got positioned, he was pretty tough to, tough to move out. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I will be Googling Tom Borwinkle later, <laughs> watching some tape. <laughs> hey, buddy. Have you ever done... Wait a second. You have to tell me your name. My name is Ezekiel Wilson. Nice to meet you. Have you ever dunked on a player? Have I ever dunked on a player? Yes. Uh, dunking was really not one of my specialties, but I'm sure I dunked on somebody along the way. I, I can't remember it, but um, you know, uh, I'm 68 years old and am still physically in pretty good shape. I, my knees don't bother me. Uh, my hips don't bother me, uh, and I tell people it's because I never ran fast enough or jumped high enough to get hurt. So I dunk, <laughs> I, I'd rather shoot a 15-foot jump shot than dunk on somebody. Thank you, Ezekiel. <laughs> I thought you were leading into that there was still a chance for you to dunk on someone. <laughs> no, no. That's no, where I thought no, you were. No, my, no my, dunking days are, <laughs> my dunking days are long past. Hello, my name is Michael Achu from Worcester. What was, what was your favorite basketball player when growing up? You, you know what? That's a great question because I didn't have one. I, I got a very late start in my athletic career. I did not play for an organized team until I was in the seventh grade. And I went out for football. and. The coach, the first day, said, now, men, we're going to start with the basics. Is there anybody here that doesn't know how many players play on a football team? I'm in the seventh grade. Guys start nudging one another. This coach is a pretty funny guy. I went home and looked it up in the encyclopedia. I had no idea how many players played on a football team. And so I was, I was always kind of behind. But my favorite team, as I alluded to earlier, my favorite team of all time, today, if you said you can go to any game, where would you want to go? I would say Chicago Cubs and Wrigley Field. And so I grew up thinking I was going to be the next shortstop for the Chicago Cubs. And my hero growing up was a great Hall of Fame baseball player for the Cubs named Ernie Banks. And so, I really didn't have a favorite basketball player. I wanted to be Ernie Banks. Great, excellent question. And then we always save the hardest question for last, Dan. Here comes the closer. Okay. <laughs> Hi, bud. My name is Jaden Delalu, and how does it feel to be drafted to the um, ABA? Um, you know, it, it felt great. That's, uh, I, I was always, uh, of course, I'm tall, but I didn't have great uh, athletic skills. As I said, I didn't jump very, jump very high or run very fast, but I worked really hard at it. And so to have the success that, uh, that I had in college to be a first-round draft pick in the ABA, it, it just felt like all of that hard work was worth it. And so I was very excited. Thank you, Jaden. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please give a Springfield, Massachusetts thank you to Dan Nissel. Thank you all very much.